that. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to rattle off a quick intro. I'm just going to read from here, um, and then I'll jump into it. Welcome to episode number six of Brisbane Base. Today, my guest is Jason Ralston, co-founder and managing director of BlackRock, a modern multidisciplinary and multi-million dollar executive recruitment firm that has progressed literally from Jason's dining room table around August of 2018, roughly, mm -hmm. to now over 20 staff and approaching eight figures in revenue a mere 18 months on. You may have already crossed that, I'm not sure. We have, yeah. That's so awesome. <laughs> Formerly, Jason also co-founded Just Digital People, a recruitment organization writing $10 million in annual fees with over 40 staff and offices across three states. And Jason was also highly instrumental in the development of Humanize Group, yet another progressive recruitment firm. And if all that wasn't enough, in addition to Jason's near decade long and highly decorated career in recruitment, he's also founded and overseen the growth as non-executive director of Just Media Design, a social media marketing firm, Just Construction Group, a residential construction company, and Monopoly Ventures, a real estate investment outfit. A true student of the game and leader of the pack, Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Carter. Thanks for having me on. I don't think you realize all the things you've done until it's all read back to you in that, in that manner. Yeah. You've, you've been a busy man. Yeah, I have, yes. Yeah. And good, I was, good people around me as well. Absolutely. And I was, I'm pumped to have you on because over the course of your career in recruitment, either directly or indirectly, you've overseen and guided thousands of high performing applicants into high paying roles. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to start off with some general career advice and specifically around identifying what industries to get into, how to get your foot in the door after you've decided that, how to nail the interview, and then what to do thereafter to succeed in the workplace. Mm. Um, but I guess to start us off and to backtrack a little bit, what are the industries or careers or occupations you're noticing right now that just pay super well? Like if someone is just optimizing for money, like I want to get rich, what mm. should they consider doing at the moment um, from what you're seeing? Yeah, I would say anything that's sales-based, yeah. so from car sales, Mercedes Benz, you got a brand new office down there at Breakfast Creek. Yeah. Uh, to recruitment, to real estate. Yep. Um, long journeys, but you can end up making really, really good money. Um, but the more obvious ones in the last five years would probably be um, coding, so mm. um, web development. Yeah. Um, they're in high demand. Their salaries are going up five to ten percent every single year. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. Pay aside, do you personally have any strong opinions on how someone, let's just say they're in high school, maybe graduating from university, like how does someone decide what to get into? Do they look internally based on what they're interested in? Do they look externally to what the market mm. value should they anticipate? Like what's growing quickly? Like you just said, digital. Mm. Like is there a right answer? Like do you have an opinion? Um, oh, there's so much commentary around this these days. Heaps. Um, I, was, I was having dinner the other night with someone who had overheard me sort of razzing my young sister about she has to have it figured out yeah. um, before she leaves. And she's in grade 12 uh, this year, so she'll graduate 2020. Mm. Um, and you know, you're actually, like, this is going to be probably not the answer you're expecting, mm. but I actually don't think you need to have it figured out. Mm. I don't think you should have it figured out. Right. Um, there's so many things you can do and make, make money from mm. um, these days as opposed to, you know, 10 years ago when I was sort of coming out of, uh, of high school. So... Look, I, I think um, if I had my time again, I'd, I'd travel. I'd travel and enjoy myself. True. Yeah. 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 Because it's, it's interesting to me because your pathway to getting to where you are today, and obviously you love what you do now, right? Mm, absolutely. Um, you didn't start in recruitment. You started in, in real estate. I did, it, yeah. I made a few pivots to get here. Uh -huh. So the path isn't always straight No, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I stressed and stressed and stressed and oh, stressed yeah. until I... I was clicking and I felt like I, you know, my job was together and that, that sort of made me feel like a complete being, you know? Yeah. So, so the yeah. advice is to kind of like, just understand the macro picture. You're not going to have it figured out straight away, but yeah. don't stress about it. Absolutely. I love that. Absolutely. If someone's listening, they are, you know, in your sister's position, maybe a bit older, maybe a bit younger, about to graduate high school, maybe they're about to graduate university or in the midst of it. Um, what sort of things should they be, like, let's just say they do know, what mm -hmm. sort of things should they be thinking about, maybe doing or focusing on at that age to sort of maximize their employability out the gate? Like, I know you've talked about meetups, networking, uh, opinion pieces on LinkedIn. Is mm -hmm. that kind of the extent of it? Is there a bit more to it from um, what you can see? No, I would say the opinion piece thing, I'm probably, I'm probably backgrounding a little more these days yeah. um, because actually doing the work is, is much more important. However, the networking events, like going along to networking events, introducing yourself mm. and asking a lot of questions of people that are uh, 
are in places now that you feel like you might want to be, mm. it's probably the best thing to do. Um, apart from that, because I mean, everything comes from your relationships and who you know, really, and I still believe that. So I'd, I'd definitely say networking events, find them, go to them, and then you've just got to get over it, you know, stop procrastinating about being shy. Because that's the hardest part. Uh -huh. I've been to very few. Uh -huh. And the worst part is when you first walk in, and let's yeah. just say you're on your own, you know yeah. nobody. Do you, do you have any little hacks that you implement to sort of get over that? I'm just it as shy as the next person at them. Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. Um, but there will always be someone slinking off to the side and you can go and, you know, introduce yourself or ask them how their day was, the weather, real basic things and sort of just roll forward from there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, there's... there's there's so many different things you can say there that sort of in terms of hacks, but just find someone sleeping off to the side that feels, you know, that might be as shy as you. Mm, just approach them. Yeah, they've they got the same feelings, so, yeah. yeah. Now, on the topic of tertiary education, I'd be curious to know, given your experience on the front line, how much value employees are still placing on candidates having tertiary qualifications. Like, is that still, like, essential to get your foot in the door, or is it perhaps not as important as it may of once been? Um... I've got to be careful what I say here. Sure. Because I've got some... Uh, Hedge your bets if you have to. <laughs> some, some uh, you know, important tertiary clients. Um, look, I think it still very much has a place mm. in, um, you know, modern society and, and the whole um, economic sort of getting jobs and, and, that, and that realm. Um, however, more and more, you know, from the big fours to the big four consultancies, the big four mm. banks, etc., cetera, are, are dropping the need to have degrees of kinds to, to start out, you know, in the, in those professions. However, for accountants, doctors, lawyers, still, still very important, obviously. Um, but yeah, look, it's in, in the digital space, the IT space, um, it's still a league of its own in that, you know, you've just got to be, you've just got to understand how to do the work mm. and you can be um, home taught. So how to do that? Yeah, yeah. Well, therefore like YouTube, right? So yep. therefore that kind of, you know, places less importance on going to a to a university to get a degree or, or a TAFE to get a diploma. In because because the merit of actually yeah. knowing how to do the thing exactly. is valued more than the qualification saying exactly, you can. exactly. Um, because because sorry, but right. YouTube and what you can learn on there in the digital space moves quicker, and so therefore you're going to learn things at a more relevant current pace if that makes sense whereas the curriculums in the universities and the and, and then TAFE uh, you know can be semesters tri semesters behind yeah there's they're slower moving simply simply that yeah. that's a, that's actually a huge point because the competitive advantages and things like investing digital marketing mm. just to take two tried examples they are constantly evolving and being competed away so if you're not at the cutting edge it's like that that inside of that that piece of knowledge you had is a redundant in three months based on new thing X. Yes, So you've exactly. got to be right there and YouTube's a, a great way to do yeah. that. I yeah, love that. It's brilliant, man. Now, interesting question then to sort of continue along that pathway of perhaps circumventing going through the traditional pathway. Let's just take a tried example. Someone like in my situation, mm -hmm. um, you know, having a real estate background played a humble role in, in building that business alongside Drew. For someone like me, could I just, like you said, for a big four consulting firm or a more corporate business environment would I be able to still like is there a back way for me to get in there like is or is is it still you have to go through the seek.com ad or a recruiter and you need to put it on CV and if CV doesn't say degree you're just not getting the interview in the first place are you talking more specifically about say like a Deloitte or a Price Waterhouse yeah. Coopers sort yeah. of thing yeah yeah um, no you would you would have to have a degree mm. um, if you're if you're at your age with your experience in market you're going to have to have a degree and get mm. it get go through via a graduate program of sorts um, however if you're late 30s and you've spent 10 to 15 years in a in a um, you know founder led um, agency of kinds mm. um, then it'll be much easier for you to get in that way but you're still going to have to do 10 to 15 years worth of, of, of real life experience commercial experience in those in those sort of founder letter agencies to get in so mm. yeah no at this point in your career if you want to work at Deloitte yeah you're going to probably have to go through a grad program or someone like me yeah <laughs> now continuing on that train of thought of thinking outside the box also something I did um, at 18 years old was the the tactic of the cold email to the industry executive to mm. shadow for a day or a week whatever it may be to get your foot in the door that way. Is that 
effective in your opinion? Is that underutilized in your opinion? What is it, your thought of thoughts on that strategy? Um, it's definitely underutilized. Yeah, wow. Well. Definitely underutilized. That's why I think um, recruiters still have a, a huge part to play. Um, obviously, there's lots of other different reasons, but that that cold introduction um, is is something that people just shy away from, just because you know pure self-esteem, rejection, etc. Everything that goes in into it there that can can hurt us human beings when we want to do a cold reach out. Um, but I think that. I think more people need to do that. Mm. They'll get themselves in some, some really interesting places if they do. Yeah. As yourself, you know. Yeah, 100%. So yeah. that's interesting. Now, let's just say someone has managed to get their foot in the door. They're now at a point, let's just say they have a, an interview for a position. Um, obviously, you've guided quite a few th- people through those sort of situations. Mm. So do you have any tips or, or tricks or hacks for actually nailing the interview itself? Yeah, the biggest, the biggest hack um, for nailing an interview is just to be present. So many people will go in either thinking that they're not good enough, so undersell themselves, or that they've got it in the bag and that they could definitely are going to smash it out of the park. Mm. Um, that's why there's a saying in recruitment is if a candidate comes out of an interview and you ask them how they, you think, or you ask them how they think they went, and if they say that they're not too sure and they lost the room at X point chances are they actually smashed it and if people come out and say oh i absolutely killed it they're really looking forward to seeing me in the next stage blah 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 uh chances are they bombed it so it's like a bit of a sort of industry rule of thumb between recruitment recruiters that's so interesting Mm, so um best best advice is just to be present be Mm. present in the room um don't overthink it um, but obviously understand who you're going to meet, what the company does from a very high level. Mm. I wouldn't go too in depth, but yeah, you want to you want to be present as possible. Yeah, which can be hard. Now, let's just say someone is successful in the interview, so they've got a job. Uh-huh. One of the things you talk about, which I really love, is that you know, in order to succeed in the workplace or your career, be 100% committed or, or don't bother at all, or something mm. along those lines. Mm. Um, so I'd be really curious to know because obviously you're a high performer personally. You have many at BlackRock, obviously. Mm. Matty G we're talking about before, absolutely killing it. Mm-hmm. So what does that level of obsession and commitment look like practically, like up close and personal? Like what does it mean to be 100% committed in your work? Oh, I've been looking at it a lot lately since the, the passing of Kobe Bryant and, um, and all of what you know, people are saying about him and his life and how he lived his life. Um, living your life right is really, really important. And, and I guess the people that um, are, are achieving all these so-called accolades um, are living their life right and they've, they've figured out how to you know, have, have a lot of discipline and rigor around their life. Mm. Um, it's something that you know, I know a lot of people struggle with. I know I struggle with it personally, but when you start to put a lot of discipline in your life um, in order to chase something and that's bigger than yourself or a bigger goal um, and, and obviously as a result being a part of something that's bigger than yourself, you know, there's that pull and it just kind of happens but yeah we could sit here all day and talk about d- the, all the different hacks of discipline that are needed to to achieve you know big goals or be great mm. but yeah i think that's the that's what it will look like up close and personally um personal is having a lot of discipline in your life okay something i know you know a lot about <laughs> not as much as you that's for sure <laughs> um and what I find interesting is when you do hop on the tools personally, you know, you're recruiting at that executive level, executive level above mm. the $200,000 pay bracket. Mm. Um, so I'd be curious to know if you've sort of noticed, besides commitment, any other sort of patterns that have emerged or, or trends that you've noticed of people who earn, you know, a quarter million dollars of a year or, or sometimes mm. more than that. Mm. In, in what way patterns of... Like, like, is there a certain archetype of, of that person? Like, do they have, like, are they super driven? Are they are really good with people, is it kind of hard to tell because it's very dependent it's, on the it's, it's definitely a mixture, but the one glaringly obvious thing with people that you know, are earning good money um, in, in industry, or at least the industries that I work in, um, is that they're very good with people. Mm. They're quite self-aware, uh, they're humble, um, and they, they understand how to, uh, to appeal to people's best interests in, in order to, to bring people together to achieve X. Um, yeah, being good with people is is, is very 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 important. Mm. Oh, you can't you can't um, yeah you can't underestimate that. Yeah, yeah. 
to switch up the pace a little bit for the more entrepreneurial among us, obviously we're here at BlackRock HQ. So uh -huh. um, like I said, I think roughly the organization is about a year and a half old, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, a bit more um, than a year and a half, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, and as you said before, obviously you've done, you passed the 10 million in rev mark, so congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. um, over 20 staff here, but we're only sitting here on, on Adelaide Street, an entire floor completely renovated because of a previous indifference you had with one of your <laughs> uh, past co-founders yeah. at JDP. So yeah. I'd be really interested to know what you've learned from that experience mm. and then more specifically, what any aspiring co-founders need to know about getting into business with someone else, mm. what needs to be agreed upon up front and what sort of things you need in writing, that, that sort of vibe. Yeah, um, I know when that all first happened, um, May 2018, I, I, I did certain posts about getting things in writing, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, getting things in writing really means nothing if you don't have uh, one, one ingredient in a, in a um, business partnership, and that's respect. Um, I think that it's really, really important to have um, healthy, uh, genuine amount of respect with your co-founder because... When things get tough, or um, when when it's you know you need to make you know hairy decisions about the way forward, if you're not um, trusting or respectful of your co-founder, it's just it's just a bad foundation for things to move forward. Um, you think you're getting ripped off. Uh, you think that someone's trying to uh, step on your toes. All those nasty things start to creep in. But if there's a genuine respect between the two people, um, I think even in, in personal relationships, it's just the bedrock for things to be successful going forward. Mm. So one, one piece of advice of the things that I've learned over the last, well, since going through the exit of my last, last group was there needs to be genuine, genuine amount of respect between the two mm. or the, the, the top people in the organization. Yeah. And I find it really interesting because it, it seems as though you've extracted that insight and many mm. others and you've kind of flipped them on their head here at BlackRock. So, <clears throat> you know, in the past where perhaps maybe room wasn't made, you know, for you on the cap table in perhaps an inappropriate way, you're, you're more than, you're going out of your way to make sure you reverse that <laughs> for some of the high performers here. Given, yeah. you know, given enough time and if they put in the work and if they're the right sort of person, mm. um, they could have a, a slice of it here, which is, mm. you know, which is an extremely exciting proposition for anyone. Mm. Um, I'd love to know your sort of philosophy behind growing the pie by giving a slice of it to the people who are, who are helping to, to make this place what it is. Yeah, um, there's lots and lots of different trains of thought when it comes to equity and yeah. um, space on the cap table for, for high performers in a business. Um, I think that the way recruitment is these days, um, if people can subjugate their ego, have that respect um, and, and work together, you can create uh, a really awesome outfit. Um, the reason I think that um, there's a lots and lots of different recruitment companies starting up probably every other month is because people don't want to go and join forces and work together because they don't understand how to share. Um, the respect is also not quite there as well. Um, everyone thinks that they know better. And so therefore we've sort of got this environment now in the market where, you know, all over Australia, there's every, every other person's going out and starting their own company. Um, now look, they can, they can say, oh, I only want to be one or two people. Um, but a lot of those, those people have come from big teams who I know personally have had dreams of listing organizations, mm. recruitment organizations, you know, and, and making them huge and successful in that right. So, um, yeah, back to, sorry, where, where, where did you sort of want, uh, that was what, it, what my thoughts are around sort of yeah, what, sharing. Why, why, yeah, why do it? Yeah, why do it? Why do it? Well, yeah, so why do it is so that you can create something that's bigger than yourself. Um, you know, I've always been a, a firm believer in, um, in sharing to get to where you need to get to and anything you ever need or want is going to come from another person, right? Mm. So if you can understand that and understand that if I can align myself with like-minded people and share um, and, and have a give and take and trade well, then, you know, to some respects, you will create something that's, that's bigger than yourself. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm just not, I'm not one of those people that wants to, you know, hold all the pie for myself. And typically from what I've seen, those sorts of organizations take a lot longer to grow. Um, and, you know, if, if indeed growing and, and creating something that's bigger than yourself is your true goal, which it is for me, 
than sharing space on the cap table and organizing a plan that allows people to get in um, where appropriate uh, is it's just an, it's the thing that you have to do. Mm. So even from a purely commercial standpoint, if you just want to maximize the end value of what you're building here, it kind of makes sense you know, to incentivize the employees mm. to want to come to work to stay that extra hour you know, on occasion, that sort of thing. Yeah. It's, it makes sense purely based on that alone, yeah. you're saying. Absolutely. I love that. Now, um, I'm excited for this next part because you kind of alluded to it before with Kobe and sort of the learnings from that. Um, but with everything we've kind of just talked about, whether you're the 18 year old, now you have some great tips to, to go on and approach your next career or you're the small to medium business owner perhaps now thinking about how mm. you're going to incentivize your employees and share the pie. There's so much ahead of us in life. There's always something to do. There's always something more to aim for when you do achieve your previous goals. Mm -hmm. And you wrote something on LinkedIn which really caught my attention. And I'll, um, I'll read it out. Um, if you get what you've been chasing, you won't be any happier than you are right now. Think about that. And if you see this, decide to have the best week of your life. So I'd be really interested to, to hear your sort of thoughts on this almost contemporary philosophy about work and life and how you're sort of holding that thought in your head alongside the thought of the ambition to build a huge company because they mm. seem to be uh, opposing. Mm. Um, they're only opposing if you... Um, we can get quite deep here. Yeah. But they're only, they're only really opposing if you're um, not in love with yourself and you're not... Um, at peace with yourself and, and don't quite understand yourself as well as you probably should. Um, that, by that, I mean, if you're trying to have a, you know, that, that, that balance in the outside world, outside of work, but then you're also trying to achieve you know, giant feats of, uh, of, of goals inside of work, um, those two can easily start to sort of you know, collide and the two worlds can collide because one gets more time than the other. Mm. Um, so I think where that, I, I do remember that post, where that came from was, I must have been reading a book of, um, I think maybe it was Ryan Holiday book. Um, it just talks about, at the end of the day, um, you want to make sure that you know, you're happy within yourself. Um, and I think that's most important. Um, so at the start of this year, we set um, some really big goals for all of us here in the organization. Um, and they were really money goals. Now, it's had an interesting impact on people's um, you know, stress levels already in the first four or five weeks of the year. However, um, they know as well as I do that it's important to make sure that you know, we, we're sort of happy within ourselves and we're you know, living a balanced life and healthy and all that sort of thing, mm. first and foremost. Um, so I'm not quite sure if that answers your question, but you can so. have huge goals, sure, from a professional sense, but it is far more important what happens off the field than on the field. Mm, interesting. And on that same train of thought, there's something else that you wrote on your LinkedIn. I'm practically reading to you here, but um, <laughs> witnessing someone who's obtained a heavy amount of money in material possessions, yet who hasn't had the chance in life to create great memories and experiences mm. with people they really care about has me thinking about time off work. Because mm. when it's all said and done, I really don't think the money or status you made will rank as high or feel as good to you as the memories, experiences, and relationships you made with others, period. So I'd be really curious to know sort of how you're thinking about balance. You know, if you can't, if you couldn't possibly use $100 million properly in your lifetime, like what's the right benchmark to aim for? Like how are you thinking about work, life, and time, and money, and all these different things? Yeah, um, not to scare anyone that's um, relying on me in a professional sense, but probably a month or a fortnight doesn't go past where I don't fantasize about um, exiting this and doing something completely different with my life. Um, but I think the thing that's, that is holding me here is things internally that I want to prove to myself, which I think you know, no one can take that away from me and that's something that I've been on for a long time now. I need to prove things to myself, which I think are important. Yes, in certain aspects they've tweaked and, and adjusted, but I think that no matter what your goals are professionally and that, that people can see that, that love and hate you, um, I think that the number one thing, again, like I just said before, is how you feel um, in silence when there's no one around and how you genuinely feel about yourself and, and, the, and the, the hero's journey or the, the path that you're on in life. I think that's the number one uh, most important thing. The person I was writing about there in that uh, post is actually my grandfather. Wow. So he, 
So I was born into a, into a religion where no TV, you couldn't eat without people outside. Um, so at lunch times at school, mum would drive up and I'd go out and sit in the car and eat. Um, wouldn't go to the cinemas, couldn't watch TV, radio. I used to collect basketball cards. So that was, you know, whether that was allowed or not at the time, this is in the 90s. Um, that, was, that was kind of like my, my, you know, and newspapers, my only sort of outside world, um, you know, connection with the outside world. And obviously social media wasn't around either. We, we left in the year 2000, but he's, he has lived his life uh, and he's in, he, I'm sure he probably doesn't have a year or so left. He'll, he'll, he'll pass my grandfather, but he's lived his life where he's um, quite wealthy, uh, has worked extremely hard um, and hasn't been able to travel because you're not allowed to travel. Every day you've got to report to church um, and so therefore he's lived his life a certain way. And um, it just got me thinking, so I went to see him a couple of weeks ago, and it just got me thinking about people who want to approve so much to themselves um, that it takes your life out of balance. And what I mean by that is they want to become the richest person in the world or they want to have X amount of you know, material fiat currency value uh, to their head, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the memories that they've created in their life or the time they've taken off to spend with loved ones um, is just not really there. You know, they've never really placed much focus or emphasis on that in their life. And so when, when everything's about to go and the lights are about to be out forever for you, I just, it got me really thinking about the things that really, really matter. And look, sure, being able to create a company there where your family can work and, and you can sort of provide that pathway for the generations to come might seem important, it started to not become that important because if you weren't there for them genuinely, um, from a, in a deep sense, to, to, you know, to, to sort of hang with them and, and create fun memories of sorts and go through the good and bad, then everything else doesn't really matter as much, it seems. Um, yeah. Man, that is like, that is a monologue of the century. <laughs> I love that. So that's sort of the stuff I'm on lately is... You know, having gone through the stuff I've gone through and, you know, a big part of it was trying to, you know, leaving my last group and doing this was to sort of really prove a lot externally. It's very empty if you, you're you not filled up inside. Mm. So those sorts of things, you know, family and the ones you love and the ones that you really care about, making memories and doing life with them is where really this sort of balance has come in for me lately. Mm. So. Yeah, as much as life can be an external game and, and winning all the levels, it's at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, it's about how you feel about yourself when you're by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, to get practical, remaining on the topic of balance, about five months ago, maybe a bit more than that, you began experimenting with you know, putting the phone down completely after mm. 6 p.m. on weekdays, shutting off as much as you can as a business owner on week, uh, weekends, um, you know, taking a time away from social media, on occasion deleting things like Instagram altogether. Mm. I'd be really interested to know what those sorts of things have yielded for you in a personal sense from a mental health standpoint and things mm. like that and then has it done anything positive for your business in terms of your productivity and the intensity with which you work as well mm. still early days um but there's people that think i'll go i'll come back onto instagram i actually don't even think about it anymore for the first few weeks i'd you know get soph's phone and check instagram and want to see what's happening but it was just the same stuff and nothing interesting was really on there um but it's, it's, it's much more peaceful, not having an Instagram in my life. And obviously, Facebook, I haven't really been on that actively for a long time now, probably a few years. Um, but it, and look, it's still early days in terms of the real benefits it's going to have in the business. Um, but I've been doing this now coming up 10 years. And I know from experience that the more you stay online after hours to try to get that extra prospect to answer your call, to get that deal closed, um, and then the next one and the next one, it gets to the point where at the end of the week, you know, a lot of the time I notice myself and other, other salespeople around me wondering if they've done enough. So I think that um, understanding what enough is and what enough is for you and it's going to be different for everyone is just so important to, to stillness and, and your, you know, your solitude and, and obviously being more a person of virtue than sort of, again, externally validated things like deals and likes and interaction and engagement so for me that's that's what I want to create is um, you know focus on myself and and those that are in my teams and on my teams over all the external stuff 
so that's I know it's a pretty broad statement that last part, but um, obviously um, there's gossip about other recruiters and what other recruiters will be doing. Um, that happens, um, to be fair, not a lot on this floor, but uh, and and in the, at the start of creating Black Rocket happened a lot from me, and so what I've found is that can be a lot of a lot of anxiety created as a result of what that other person's doing. If they're making the call right now while you're just chilling. And that's just the, the wrong train of thought for so many reasons. There's so much comfort and, and power, I guess, if that's the right word, in just worrying about whether you're doing the right thing or not, or you're, you're doing what you need to do and that's that. Mm. You know, not comparing, and a lot of people say compare to, don't compare to other people. So I think that's where it comes from, you know. Just try to compare yourself to yourself and, and that's, that's where I think that, you know, it's early days, but I think that'll be, there'll be, um, It'll it'll be really really good really really good sort of um, I don't know how do you what do you want it'll to call it like a, it's a, it's a good religion to sort of cut off at six um, you know not have any contact over the weekend with other people although this is a Sunday and we're sitting here recording this sure um, you know like I think giving yourself setting your enough mark is is really important because mm. an intense rest I found is important to intense work. And you're not getting much done if you're not working intensely. So yeah, you were doing 3 a.m. wake ups. Ridiculous. And you know you can do it for a little bit because you're super excited and the adrenaline's there, but and eventually it, it wears off. I couldn't, I did. And you're exactly right. There becomes there is a day, and my body just refused to wake up one day. I was like, oh no, this is I can't keep doing this. Like yeah. I need to find a, another way around. Yeah. Um, on the same vein as to everything we were just talking about, and you kind of alluded to it a few times and previously in the interview, but I guess a close cousin of, of putting the phone down and being away from social media is inviting a certain sense of solitude and isolation and introspection and being with your thoughts. So um, once again, another quote from LinkedIn, but healthy, regular isolation solves most problems, recharges your batteries every time the best vice there is on this planet. Um, mm. I've really enjoyed, you know, bouts of, you know, just trying to sit with my thoughts for half an hour, whatever. It's extremely refreshing mentally, uh, physically, whatever it may be. Mm. Um, how has it helped your business? How has it helped your mindset? Um, being calmer is, is really important to me, especially uh, in, my, in this business. Um, from the earlier days, I wasn't very calm and I'd barely have a, a second of, uh, of stillness before I was reaching for the plethora of distractions that were around me. Um, and so as a result, I would make posts very different to the posts that I made, I've made in the last you know, year and a half. Uh, and it was very detrimental to my brand you know I was very on edge um, and as a result unfortunately a lot of people know me from my previous sort of you know seven years or so uh, as 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 being sort of highly controversial sometimes inappropriate um, and that all came from a result of not having much stillness you know maturity plays a big part of, of well as well of course but um already just you know having the maturity and the awareness even to um just go look that's enough mm. and, and cut off uh, has translated into so many different positive aspects of course i'm only scratching the surface well such a such a long way to go yep. with it but the difference if that if that's really the comparison the difference you know when i didn't have much stillness how i was how i would you know get upset with stuff and not have much patience and and then that just translated into bad business as opposed to the last year and a half, um, being able to, you know, have that stillness on demand and have certain, even in the last five, six months, really switching off at six o'clock and then over the weekends, it just gives you so much more space so you can be a bit more calmer and be, be more calculated with the moves that you make mm. as a result. I find, especially in your position now, because you're steering a big ship here now, so to have a calm mindset and sound judgment and be able to think rationally about your decisions mm. allows you to make more of the right ones. And the right decision you make impacts 20 plus people. Mm. Mm. So it's, it's more important than, than ever really for you. So I find that really Absolutely. interesting. Yeah. Um, within the context of, of this whole discussion we're having, obviously a man, and you've mentioned his name before, that you know, his work aligns perfectly with all this is Ryan Holiday. Mm -hmm. And obviously two of your favorite books of all time you mentioned, uh, yeah. Stillness is the Key and, and um, Ego is the Enemy. Ego is the Enemy. And I'll include links to both in the description. So yeah. check them out if, you, if you're Great curious. Books. Um, yeah, what, what have you learned from him? What have you learned from those books? Um, to be sober, which is something I, I still struggle with. like to have a drink from time to time. 
um, but to be sober um, and to really understand yourself and you know really try to reach for that solitude and be more a person of virtue than anything else it's just you know uh, I don't know I, I hope that's what he- heaven's like if heaven's a real thing mm. you know um, so on a deep level that's the sorts of things that he's taught me you know from reading his book I remember the first book I read was coming back from Bali um, in 2018 I think it was April and actually um, my ex-co-founder was with me on the plane and I remember just like every couple of chapters reading on me like damn this, this book is giving me a hiding right now <laughs> mm. um, so yeah like yeah Ryan Holiday is an extraordinary uh, storyteller and I mean, a lot of what he, he recites is, is, is stoic, stoic philosophy, um, and he just modernises it in such a beautiful way um, that, you know, it really encapsulates you and, 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 and teaches you um, timeless principles that are, you know, thousands of years old. Mm. So, yeah, I, I, I urge anyone to have a bit of a look at his, uh, his writings. Mm. Yeah, he's a gifted author. That's awesome. And I guess to change gears again as we work towards wrapping up, I really wanted to touch on sort of, you know, your, your goals, I guess, for the long term, like your vision for the company. Obviously, I was scrolling way back on your Instagram and I noticed there's a, there's a BlackRock branded private jet from back in the day. <laughs> I saw a mention of $100 million somewhere in there. Yeah. Obviously, you've always had ambitions to grow this into a global thing. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious to know where your head's at and what you define as success now. Yeah, is forward. my Instagram still live? It, it, it is again now, I, like is very it? recently. My, my personal one? Yeah. Oh, wow. There we go. <laughs> Breaking I news. That, I wonder how that <laughs> happened. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, okay. Um, goals for the future. Um, I, I would love to take BlackRock globally. Um, I would love to create um, complementary... Um, it's complementary, wrong word. Com- uh, businesses that complement BlackRock well. For example, um, whether it be product companies, software product companies, or a, um, a consultancy, a software consultancy of sorts, um, in, in very light discussions with, about that at the moment. Um, you know, my goals still haven't changed from in, in terms of from a, from a professional standpoint to what they were, you know, three, four, five years ago. Um, you know, still look at megalomania and creating lots of different businesses as a result um, of having the, you know, the first business, which was recruitment and obviously, you know, businesses that complement that. So yeah, in terms of numbers and all of that sort of thing, it's not, that's not really a focus to do it right. Um, you know, and some would say scaling to 20 people um, without any external investment is not probably right in that, in that sense. But you know, um, just building it with the right people. Um, and I know we do have to settle down on the hiring at the moment, but um, yeah, just taking, taking my time. I've got a very, very, you know, long-term vision with this organization, um, it sort of sits around 20 years. Um, but yeah, make the, the overarching goal is to make those people around me rich. Mm. Um, I've just, I've always been, you know, that's always lit me up deep inside my brother, my, my sister, my family, um, and then people that have been around me have always done well, uh, always eaten well. And um, yeah, that's whatever that looks like and how, mu- how much I can scale that is, 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 the, is the overarching goal. That's the target, I love it. Mm. And you just kind of touched on it, obviously, um, you have a lot of people here. If someone has kind of you know, heard about what you've accomplished in, in such a short period of time and just heard where you want to go with it and they're, they're inspired, they want to come and be a part of what you're creating, what is, um, what is something maybe a little outside the box someone could do to sort of at least get on your radar for when you're next looking to make that hiring decision, get on the shopping list as a potential candidate? Yeah. What, how can someone stand out to you personally? Um, it'd be about, um, it'd be about uh, sort of waiting their turn or um, just doing the right thing in their life. Um, and by that, by that I mean... Um, you know, um, doing the right thing at work, working with a level of integrity. Um, You know, if they're starting out, I know that I'm talking about more balance than someone that's, you know, 10 years into the game now, myself, but I still believe as a rookie starting your career in, say, recruitment, um, you need to work extremely hard, but 
I would urge you, it's recruitment's great, you don't have to work on the weekends, so have your weekends really off the radar, uh, but during the week, really work hard. Just do the right, do the right thing. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting question. It's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be very humble, but, and it's, you know, I'm flattered that you would ask that question, but yeah, look, just work hard for themselves, do, mm. do the right thing, um, understand themselves, um, and probably ask around about the mistakes I made when I was starting out and don't do those things. Yeah. Something you just mentioned, which really interests me and I want to touch on quickly before we get to the last question is, you know, in that rookie stage of your career, first year, two, three, you can't circumvent needing to work really hard. So mm-hmm. as much as we're talking about, you know, switching off, this is, is, is that more an executive mindset now that you're at the, the top of the game or towards the top or at the pinnacle, you can afford to do those sorts of things and slow down? Or is that for everyone, but just to varying degrees, how they should adopt yeah, it? Yeah, look, everyone to varying great degrees. Yeah, look, I said like just then, with young recruiters, I think they should take the weekends off and they yeah. should not, not be connected. But um, I think that it's very important for me now to try to find that calmness. Otherwise, if I'm carrying on at the same as I did in my first five years of my career, to in this, this last five years, you know, what took me there is not going to take me to the next boat, etc. Sure. however that sure. saying goes. So it's just very much that. Yeah. But yeah, find that space. And that, and that stillness to varying degrees as to where you're at. But in the beginning, work hard, work with intensity. You do, you do. You do have to make those early morning um, BD calls. You do have to make those late night, take those late night meetings, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we get to the last question, where can everyone find you on social, if they can, um, and BlackRock as well, if you'd like to plug Yeah, that. LinkedIn. LinkedIn's our main channel yeah. um, f- for now. Um, our website's pretty good as well, blackrock.co. Mm. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Last question. We've talked about a lot today. And uh-huh. I know that. Uh-huh. What's, um, what is one important truth that, that you really believe to your core or perhaps you've adhered to throughout your career that's proven you know, to guide you in the right direction that perhaps if it was presented to a group of people or society, they, they'd disagree with that. They wouldn't think that's good advice. Like what counterintuitive truth should more people be thinking about? Business life doesn't matter. Um, I don't know if there's one thing over the course of say the ten years that I've been in recruitment that's that's rung true um, that people would disagree with. I'd, I'd probably say um, the whole sharing aspect. A lot of people don't want to start a company and they don't want to give any of the pie away, and that's I completely um, respect where they're coming from, but. If you want to build something of size, you do need to make room on the cap table. Um, you do need to do it the right way, um, you know, and it's taken me nearly a year with legals and discussions and meetings to get it done right for BlackRock. And I'm really proud of the structure that we've got in place now. I'm looking forward to seeing that play out. But yeah, I think, you know, sharing, sharing space on the cap table for people that, you know, really want to be vested into the country, the company long term, mm. I think really, really important. Love it. Man, thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. Thanks. Cheers. It's a wrap.